Everyone, welcome and thank you for joining us for our Wednesday webinar series, Lunch with the Birds. Uh, this series is presented by the Ohio Bird Conservation Initiative. My name is Amanda Duren. I'm the program coordinator for OBCI. Um, the Ohio Bird Conservation Initiative is a partnership of nearly 100 organizations that support bird conservation in Ohio. And we are thrilled to be able to bring you a new webinar each month on um, a bird or conservation related topic. I hope you can join us next month. Topic, uh, Purple Martins. What a presentation by Paula Zebarth, who's also affectionately known as uh, Madam Wingnut uh, through her um, articles that she writes about Purple Martins. Again, um, our webinars are always on the third Wednesday of the month. Uh, next month, that will be February 19th from 12 to 1 p.m. And there's a, a link there to visit our website um, to register for that webinar. I also wanted to invite you to view some of our past webinars that are archived at our website, obcinet.org, again, is our web address. Um, the, some of the past um, titles we have there, last month was an introduction to eBird 101. We also have um, a really popular webinar on Ohio's woodpeckers. So I do invite you to check that out. And also a recording of today's webinar will be posted to the site um, by the end of this week. If you have any questions or problems during this webinar, please um, enter those questions into your chat box, which is on the left side of your screen. And um, I will try to help you out however I can. And if you have any questions also for our presenter, please, again, enter those in that chat box. And Jim will either address them during the presentation or um, at the end of the presentation. And with that, I would like to introduce today's speaker. We're very excited to um, introduce Jim McCormick. Jim works for the Ohio Division of Wildlife, specializing in non-game wildlife diversity issues, especially birds. Prior to that, he was a botanist with the Ohio Department of Natural Resources, the inaugural president of the Ohio Ornithological Society, and was the 2009 recipient of the Ludlow Griscom Award, given annually by the American Birding Association, to individuals who have made significant regional contributions to ornithology. An author of books including Birds of Ohio, The Great Lakes Na Nature Guide, and Wild Ohio, The Best of Our Natural Heritage. Um, the latter won the 2010 Ohio on a Bird Award, uh, Book Award. Excuse me. Jim writes a column, Nature, for Columbus Dispatch. He's authored or co-authored over 100 scientific and popular articles in a variety of publications and has delivered hundreds of presentations throughout the eastern United States. Um, he is currently at work on a book about wood warblers, which um, we're all very excited for, which is slated for uh, release in 2014. So with that, welcome, Jim. And I will go ahead and bring up your presentation. Very good. I'll trust that everyone can hear me. Uh, Really enjoyed presenting about birds, especially. I uh, drew the long saw, I guess, here to get us up. To. These webinars are a little bit different because I don't get any feedback from the groups. <laughs> so I just hope that uh, everyone has a good time and enjoys it. And I welcome you all and appreciate Amanda inviting me. Uh, Paula Zeba, if you want to hear that, that's on my birthday, actually, February 19th, and that's webinar on Purple Martins. Paula knows this, I'm sure, so we like owls, because great horned owls are known to sit up on those boxes at night and pluck the capsule of martins right out of their hole. <laughs> but owls are not just dastardly, they're very uh, interesting animals in many, many ways, and that's what I want to cover with this talk, is just how cool they are, to put it like that, and uh, what makes them tick, and what we have here in Ohio especially. Um, it's not a huge group of birds, considering there are 10,000 or thereabout species in the world. There's 215 species of owls. Um, 23 of those have been recorded in North America, but four are really rare accidental. Some 19 regular owls in Ohio. We have had 12 of those here in Ohio. Um, eight of them are every year, and four are quite rare. And I'll share those with you. Diversity, worldwide, uh, an amazing diversity of owl species, but right here in North America there is too. The owl fowl is the smallest owl uh, in North America, a tiny little thing. It weighs as much as an eastern tohi. So we're talking really dinky. They like saguaro, saguaro cactus holes, and that's where you tend to find them out in the southwest. But anyway, if you contrast 
an elf owl with a snowy owl, which of course is big news this year, as we'll get into a little bit. I would say 46 elf owls make a So this is just a huge diversity morphology or the physical appearance uh, and structure of owls. In Ohio, these are the eight heavy hitters. These are the ones that, if you worked it, you could go out and find just about every in Ohio. The snowy owl is the end one. This is really the year to find that species in Ohio and elsewhere in the eastern U.S. But all of these birds, they either breed here or have bred here in Ohio or certainly show up every year. These ones will we'll emphasize as we work our way through this presentation. Now, birders, and I know there's a lot of bird watchers on here, we have one, love our birds. Um, and there are some really rare owls that have shown up here in Ohio. And we'll take a look at a few of those just to get started. So if you were really lucky, you could uh, maybe find a boreal owl. But I would want to know about it. Call me on this one right away. Now, I'm hoping everyone can hear those well. I'm playing your vocalizations just because they're interesting uh, through my speakers. But that's what a boreal owl sounds like. But this is a species of North woods that very rarely makes it into the United States, at least the Great Lakes region. Um, they don't get this far south very often. But one hit a window in Lake County in 1997, didn't kill it. It was rehabbed and released successfully. And that is the only Ohio record of boreal owl. But you may get others. Now, this is a bird of uh, pretty young out west, and there's also a Florida population that's sedentary and not migratory, but the western ones, that's the big range of this thing in, in North America, and boarding owls migrate in the west, in the Great Plains, and those are the birds that occasionally wander east for whatever reason and show up in Ohio. And we have had uh, four records um, of Growing owl, amazingly enough. Beautiful little call. The Western movie soundtracks that actually get it right, because most of them don't when it comes to bird sounds, I have heard Westerns with that in the background. That really cool. That's you know where you would normally see a growing owl. Um, but the uh, ones that have shown up on Ohio, they probably are easily missed, and I'm sure more than have been detected. This was the last one. This was about, I don't know, five or six years ago over in Dark County, Ohio. And it was hanging out in a soybean field. These are actual photos of the bird. That's the best we could do. And it was very furtive and very difficult to see and spent most of its time in a drainage culvert. And it was just a miracle. It was never even spotted. Uh, but we will get more of that, I'm sure, eventually. Great gray owl. Ah, this is a, 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 an amazing beast. Additionally, this is the biggest owl in North America, bigger than a great horned or a snowy owl, but it's all fluff. You're basically looking at a big bag of fluff. It's all feathers and whatnot. And um, if you were to weigh the animal, it would weigh half of what a snowy owl does and, and not much more than half of what a great horned owl would. So we're just feather adaptations for very cold because great gray owls live up in the boreal forest. Now, it emits a very deep Bassano hoot that befits the massive size. That sound really goes well with it, but you're not probably ever going to get that in Ohio. See one. There's only two confirmed records, although there's probably a few others that really were never verified. The last one came from Southern in the middle of Lake Erie on Starve Island, and that's what that little islet is right there. And back in 1847, there was at least one tree on it that stuck up. And Milton Troutman, the famous ornithologist, passing by in his boat because he lived on South Island. And lo and behold, there's a great gray owl sitting in the tree on that little island. Now, Milt would have shot that bird in a heartbeat. Could he have gotten a shot at it? Probably because he was in the days of collecting and collected a lot more birds than most of us have seen in Ohio. But he couldn't get the great gray owl, but, you know, Milt's word is gold, and that's no doubt. Oh, but that's the last record, but it is, should show up in Ohio again someday. Hawk owl, there are a few more. There are probably about half a dozen records of hawk owls in a row. This is another northern species. The last, this and the last several are 
birds of the north that rarely get this far south. Hawkeyes are really cool because they're diurnal. And you know, probably diurnal active at night, diurnal active during the day. So hawkeyes sit out on the tops of trees during the day and are fairly easy to spot, uh, but just extremely rare this far south. It hasn't been a record for a while. Oh yeah, now like it's a loud, high-pitched twitter. Again, I'm likely to hear that down here in Ohio. That would be a bleeding period call up on the bleeding grounds. Well, I, I want to talk a little about uh, you know just how interesting owls are to people and how we interact with them. Well, um, I don't want to go back without a human angle because there is a big human angle. People really love owls. Uh, this is of the Ornithological Society conference uh, or symposium that was on now in uh, Houston Woods State Park, and we had 200 people. We had to turn people away, pack the whole place. Uh, people coming in to hear all about owls. Last year, the OOS, Ornithological Society, did another one up at Mohican, and same deal, filled the whole place up. People just can't get enough of owls. And the OOS, just to give them a quick plug, everyone should be a member of the Ohio Ornithological Society. Who does a lot of good bird conservation and education work, just like Amanda and CI does. But anyway, we always try and give some money back to the causes. And with that first owl symposium, we donated $1,000 to the American Owl Institute, which is based in Montana. And that's Denver Hold on the right, accepting the mock check. And Denver is Mr. Owl, basically, in North America, and runs that institute. And, was our keynote speaker. So we were pleased to help him out, and I think everyone had a good time and learned a lot of owls at that. Um, this was, a, a, the year, winter of 2004 and was an enormous uh, eruption, okay? Not like a volcano erupting, IRR eruption, which is the term for the southward engines of raptors and owls and winter finches and that sort of thing. But in 2004 uh, it was spectacular for all three of those species, great gray owl, boreal owl in the middle, and hawk owl on the right. And those are some of the number of photos that were or above it were reported um, in Minnesota and other points south. Uh, Minnesota was a hotbed for this, and people got very, very excited, and that sparked a tremendous amount of travel to Minnesota in the dead of winter when most people you wouldn't think would want to go there. But they did, and they were there to look at all these wonderful owls that were very plentiful, at least comparatively. Uh, actually, that uh, that event probably sparked the uh, Sax Bog Winter Birding Festival. Go Google that. Sax Zim Bog Winter Birding Festival. It's coming up on February 14th through the 16th, and you'll get to see a lot of those birds if you go up there. Um, really neat event. It's in its seventh year this year. Anyway, this book really did it. Uh, when J.K. Rowling, the first Harry Potter book in 1997, there's been six, six, a total of seven books. She brought owls into the limelight, probably like no work ever has done. I mean, those books have sold almost 500 million copies since the first one. And um, of course, the wizards in Harry Potter use male owls. And, uh, Harry Potter's first owl in the first book was named Hedwig, and it was a snow owl, which is especially appropriate this year. So a lot of people, kids and adults, I've read them all myself, um, know of snowy owls and lots of other owls because of the male owls in Harry Potter. So she, whether she intended to or not, really, really put owls out there in the consciousness of people in a good way, too. So that's especially exciting to have all the owls around this winter because they're just basically... Uh, giant headwigs come to life flying around the landscape. But long before J.K. Rowling and her Harry Potter books, I mean, owls are, have been in the psyche. They're um, one of the most interesting groups of birds in the world, and people have certainly looked at them and for a long time. If you look at names in the United States and uh, Canada to the north, lots of owl-named places. And this goes way back to the naming of you know, these cities and towns and various landmarks. Um, so people have been smitten with these uh, birds for a long time. 
the first art, bird art at least, uh, really the first art ever found in a cave uh, involves owls. One of the depictions is to be of a snowy owl. Um, but these, these come from the Chauvet Cave in France and date back 30 or 35,000 years. And you can see one of them here on the uh, screen. And a uh, very clear owl. Well, obviously, uh, primitive people even back then were looking at owls and interested enough to sketch them on a cave wall. <clears throat> this is a little closer to home. This was an effigy pipe that was uh, taken from a, um, a mound, a hoop ball culture mound down in Ross County near Chill Coffee. They buried a lot of artifacts in these mounds, and this came out of one of them. It's a very clear barred owl. Uh, and it's an effigy pipe. So they were interested in owls as well. People always have their eyes to look at birds. They've probably been especially in owls. This goes way back into mythology. Athena, the Greek goddess of wisdom and heroism and many other things, uh, was often depicted with an owl on her uh, plate, her face plate. Um, and a matter of fact, the genus of owls is named for her, Athene. There are four. Uh, owl species in that genus, Athene, one of which is the burrowing owl. So, to ancient Greeks, owls represented um, intelligence, among other things. They thought of them very highly. Uh, and a lot of cultures do think of owls highly. A lot of cultures don't. In some uh, superstitions, they're bad luck, well, evil omens, and other things. And you have the flip side of the coin, where well, they're good luck and mean good things. This is a uh, <clears throat> passage from the Bible, at least in the American King James Version, from Job 30, 29, I am a brother to dragons and a companion to owls. That is not flattering. Because Job had all sorts of curses brought down on him and suffered greatly, and during the depths of some of his suffering, he made that statement, you know. So, not a funny thing for owls. So, you can find lots of examples, pro and con, of what people think of owls over the years. Um, they even, they're often depicted in haunted houses, um, maybe with good reason. So you see a sketch like that, and the ob obligatory owl, silhouette, up in the tree with the bats and the black cats and all that stuff in the haunted house in the background. Maybe, um, you know, that may be rooted in some fact, um, <clears throat> because of one species of owl in particular. Well, uh, so, bear with me. Yeah. We heard that. That's the call of a barn owl. And more than a few people have wandered in and all around it like that at night and been greeted with a screech like that. And you'd think a demon was inside the house, but that's the call of a barn owl. And barn owls often take up residence in dwellings, old houses, that sort of thing. And if someone who didn't know, the uninitiated, were to hear a screech like that, and then see this big ghostly white shape drift out of a window, voila, instant haunted house. So why the fascination? Well, a big part of it, in my opinion, is that they look like people. Owls have binocular vision, so their eyes are fixed forward in their head, and they have a, an obvious face, just like a person does. So they have this somewhat person, people like look to them more than most birds do, if not any other group of birds. So, so that's going to draw people to look at them right off the bat. The uh, bizarre calls that many species make, we're going to listen to some, and we have listened to some. The fact that they're not turned, people tend to be scared of the dark. So the dark is mysterious. Then you have these big, mysterious, screeching, bizarre animals flying around there. They're bound to attract people's attention. And then they're predatorial, very adept predators, as we'll see. So we have to sit up there at the top of the avian food chain, at least. So, you know, all these factors and more really make people interested in mouse, pro or con. There's just a few facts of them that I think are interesting. So of these eight species of owls that are in Ohio every year, um, they're mostly not forest birds. I think if you ask most people, they'd say, oh, it's owls, birds of the woods. Well, not really. Only three of them are really 
utterly dependent on woodlands. The others do not. They often hung over grasslands and need a mosaic of landscapes. Um, our smallest owl is the northern sawwet owl, which we'll see, and it's a little dink of a thing, three ounces is a sawwet owl. Uh, so if you compare that with a silly owl, again, the biggest owl that occurs in Ohio, um, 22 of the little sawwets packed together to the snowy owl. Uh, and then there's some amazing adaptations that I want to talk about, like barn owls. They're a good example of this ability to uh, capture prey in like, complete darkness. No visual cues, really, although their eyes are full of rods and cones and capable of collecting whatever little light there may be. They do a good job. And then they really do a good Linda Blair act from The Exorcist. If you remember that movie, they can't spin their head all the way around, spin it at about 270 degrees because you and I only have seven neck vertebrae. They have 14. So I'm flexible that way. That's because their eyes are set in binocular fashion. They can't really take their eyes in their head. So you just turn the whole head to compensate for that. Um, they are marvels of camouflage. Okay, um, This is a good photo that this is not in uh, North American, I mean, uh, United States, to Costa Rica. And there are two owls prominently in there, and probably the only thing you're seeing of them are their, uh, let's call them eyebrows, the white lines over the eyes which is sort of disruptive camouflage and actually helps them blend better with the thick lianas or tangles that they roost in. Now I've taken, you know, blown them up and lightened the shit photo so we can see they're crested owls. And these crested owls are just about invisible, very hard to find during the day when they're roosting. It's blending in so well. Here's a, just a primo example of that with a, a, a United States owl. This is a whispered screech owl I've outlined him. And he is a pine bark mimic, like nothing else. A lichen and a pine bark mimic, and just virtually invisible when he's tucked up against the trunk of a conifer or a pine tree. Really amazing. Our, our east beach out here in Ohio is just about as good as that. I'm starting to look in. Yeah, hunting ability is uh, just remarkable. They have several adaptations out that really help them with this. This is an amazing photo of a great gray owl putting the herd on a mouse. Uh, they don't need to see the mouse or bull or small mammal. It can be under snow, and they can still triangulate on the sound that they hear so well they can unerringly punch through the snow cover and whack the little animal. It will never know what hit them. And that's what this owl is doing right there. Well, this is one reason they can do that so successfully, like that great gray owl. Here, sit on the left, that's called a Stygian owl. That's a Mexican species in, in Central American one, uh, but it just displays prominent ear tufts, like our garbage owl do as well, and long-eared owls. Those are not ears, of course, at all. Those are ornamental tufts, or those feather tufts also help conceal the bird and create a camouflage effect to it to help it hide. Um, so no ears there. The other picture is of a northern sawlet owl with the feathers back. This is a living bird that was banded and released fine, but we took advantage of this to take a photo of a real ear of an owl. The big ear, it's an enormous cavity, and it's uh, hidden by feathers on the side of the head, and you wouldn't see it. It's not still at all, better than ears. So the ears are big but hidden, concealed from view. Well, this is why they're so good. Here's a kind of a generic owl, and the line shows uh, a latitude bar with the ears on the other each side of the head depicted here. And as you can see, they're offset, they're asymmetrical. What this allows is for owl, uh, the owl's brain to process the arrival of sounds. So they hit each ear just slightly differently. I mean, we're talking maybe you know a million to the second, hundreds of thousands second. Just a tiny variation, but their uh, internal processors can deal with that and uh, focus the bird on fine tuning, you know, exactly where that sound's coming from and allow them to catch a bull into the snow and things like that. There is a good view of owls. Some species of owls, the eyes, uh, which are so important to them, can constitute 5% of the, of the bird. The bird on the right is a, a solid owl, and that's a bird, an owl that has about 5% of its mass eyes. Uh, huge. I mean, if you had eyes that were 5% of your weight, you'd really be a freak as a weight. 
Um, but for them, it's important to have those, and they're just stuck with rods and cones and all the things you need to harvest in low light situations and see well in the dark, if you will. Far now on the left, that's probably the king of ability in that world. Well, when they do finally find a, a prey item, <clears throat> the prey item will never know what hit it in many cases. And the reason for that are the leading primary fight uh, close up of a saw red owl's wing, again. Um, and you can see how it's fringed along the ledge. That's called fimbriate. Uh, so fimbriate means comb like. So those little extensions muffle the air, flow over the wing, and in effect uh, render the animal silent. It can fly silently and sneak on its prey. Good for the owl, bad for the bull. Well, when they finally do hit their prey, it's curtains. You aren't going to get away. This is the talent of a great horned owl, and these are really formidable if you've never handled one of these owls in person. I'm spread out and splayed about its talons, and the whole uh, foot is about the size of your hand. It's really impressive. Like talons, and that's it. It, it grabs you with those. Uh, you pat it, and it, it, they are basically like vices, mechanical locking devices, that once the owl clamps down and shuts those talons, you can just sort of hold them there indefinitely. Um, so there's no escape at that point. On that. Mm -hmm. One of the interesting things about owls, and, and all birds of prey do cast pellets, um, none are so prominent as owls. Um, owls, when they swallow a bull or a mouse, they digest the thing, and then the non digestibles, which is basically the fur and the bones, those are formed into a pellet inside of the bird, and then some hours later, after its meal, it up chucks the pellet. I love this photo. It's from a carpenter who let this, us use this photo in our owl publication. And he caught a snowy owl in the act of actually regurgitating. Now, pellets are good ways to find owls, too. And we'll take a look at that. But uh, here, here's what a pellet, well, three pellets look like. This this is a, a friend of mine, Tom, Joe Coffin up in Knox County. She has a barn owl in her barn. And so the floor of the barn is just strewn with these big pellets. You can see how large they are. And her granddaughter actually dissected these in a very painstakingly small route. You can see the row of skulls up above. They're probably all meadow bull skulls, would be my guess. And then the various other bones and the fur and everything associated with what once were little four-legged sausages on eggs. Running around out there that the uh, barn owl <clears throat> Okay, well, I want to get into the, uh, the big three. And when I say the big three, I'm talking about the, uh, the three most common owls in Ohio. Um, the eastern screech owl, the barred owl, and the great horned owl. These, these are uh, birds that you can go out and expect to find. You know, with, oh, not a anywhere in the state. They occur in, in every town. Uh, go ahead and take a look at those. Here's an eastern screech owl. So there, that's, that's a sound a lot of you know, I'm sure. Uh, a very quavering, tremulous trill. One of them sounds a little like a ping pong ball dropping or something. Um, this is an amazingly common owl. It's very much a deciduous forest, as you can see that by that map. And eastern uh, barely makes it into Canada. So Ohio's towards the northern edge of them. But the way to find these is by that call. Um, they're amazingly plentiful. One Toledo bird count one year, which is a 15-mile diameter, circle, and found I think it was 18. In just that one circle. So this gives you, if you know how to find them, um, they're all over the place. Every one of us listening to this probably is sitting within the earshot of a breach owl, would be my guess. Kind of two color forms, too. Not uh, not phases. It bothers me. I mean, this is uh, red phase or gray phase. These are, are morphs. Uh, they, a phase would imply it changes, like a lunar cycle. These don't change. The owl's either born as the rusty or the red uh, on the left, or the gray one on the right. It's equally 
distributed in Ohio. The grays probably are a little common to the north of Ohio and northern part of Ohio and the red to the southern part of the state. They're both out there and you can expect to see both. They really like open habitats too. Um, very much a woodland species, but kind of broken up woodlands, especially if there's a stream around. They catch a lot of fish, believe it or not. And they like to hunt in streams at night. And very, you know, confiding with a bird, and you can you know, usually walk right up to them if one's around and it'll look at you. This is often how they're found. This is a uh, box elder tree that's only about 10 minutes from my office. And the uh, this little gray screech owl was, would sit every day in this little hole, at the, um, you know, entrance to his cavities, some cavities. And this is one that you can have boxes for, uh, a suitably sized nest box. And if you're lucky, you can get screech owls in it. And sometimes they'll even use wood duck boxes out in marshes and things like that. So this one that you can work with. The insect photo on the right, that's a young one. And they're very funny. Look fairly different than the adults do, and occasionally people will see those in late summer and, you know, when they're out in summer, and um, I think they're solid owls because the ear tufts really aren't very prominent yet. Now here is, this is, this is a really cool one. This is the uh, biggest uh, common owl. <laughs> Yeah, what you heard was a pair of great horned owls duetting, a male and a female singing back and forth, and great horned owls love to do that. And the loud one was the male. The faint one that was hard to hear in the background, that was the female. The male has a lower-pitched voice, even though the female is larger uh, in size. So there they are singing. That's the classic owl hoot, basically. And this is a common species in every county in Ohio, and sometimes even in surprisingly urban areas and citified places. I love this from uh, Seton from 1890. He says, their untamable ferocity, magnificent bearing, strictly carnivorous tastes, would make me rank these wing tigers amongst the most pronounced and savage bird prey. Well, he had that right. And one nickname for this thing is the cat owl. Okay, a great one now can be five pounds, maybe even a little more, a female, and it will take Fluffy, your little cat, you know, or dog if it's small enough, so you gotta you know, watch that. Um, but they, they take big prey, bigger prey than um, any of our other owls, except when the snowies come in, can do. First bird to start nesting in Ohio. So they'll sometimes be on eggs by the end of this month, January. And most great horned owls nest on stick nests. Um, they don't bell them. They just kick the right balloon out. The bird on the nest, you can see the telltale ear tucking out over the top. That's a red-tailed hawk nest that the owl appropriated. If it wants it, the hawk is out of luck. He ain't going to win that battle in most cases. Uh, they'll often take great blue heron nests, too. So if you know where there's a heron rookery, in about a month or so, drive by it and really scan those nests up there for the tuck sticking out over the top. Might be a great horned owl in there as well. It's an uneasy alliance, but the herons have to tolerate it, and they do. Um, those are the young uh, great horned owls on the right. They look like three grocery sacks, something up there in the trees. They're very bizarre. Before they can fly, they come out of the nest, and at that stage, they're turned branchers. So, Home, sometimes considerable distances away from the nest, you know, up on the branches like that. And they're very conspicuous if you see them as they're whitish down uh, or on there. And that there's two other ways that a lot of people find uh, great horned owls. Um, one is by crows. Crows hate them with a passion. And if a crow finds a great horned owl out during the day, it will call on all its brothers. And next thing you know, you've got a really conspicuous mob of crows around it. Uh, Oz reach a fever pit. But you can tell after a while they must have a great horned owl just by the stride and nature of their calls. Another way that's interesting that you can. Now, I just saw a message in here that the audio is gone. Well, I hope that's not true. I'm going to just keep talking. Um, another way you can find great horned owls is uh, sometimes by odor. And that's because it's one of the only capture skunks. 
Well, they're going to get sprayed when they catch this, probably, but it doesn't seem to bother them. So if you ever smell a skunk that seems to be coming from up in the trees, and maybe because there's an owl nest up there, and they've rubbed up a skunk or parts thereof to feed the young, and everyone got sprayed with the musk. Um, and there you go. I found a couple of them that way myself. And this is the third big one in Ohio uh, of the common widespread species, and that's the barred owl. It's one of only two owls in Ohio with dark eyes. All the others have yellow. The other dark eyed one, of course, is the barn owl, and it doesn't have cut or uh, tufts, ear tufts. You know, nice round face. And... <laughs> There's its classic call, call, and I know a lot of you have heard that. It's one of the most conspicuous sounds of the nipples. In fact, you can't miss it if a uh, barred owl starts up and you're out there. Here's a wonderful comment about that by Oprah Cleveland Bent, who uh, was author or editor of a wonderful series of life histories uh, of North American birds. But he says, the antiphonal hootings of a pair of these owls will hold the hearer spellbound they are fairly startling as if a pair of demons were fighting. And that's a good description, very colorful. But when a male and a female get to caterwauling back and forth, it just explodes a little bit of sound. And if you didn't know what it was, it would be a very creepy thing. They also give a lot of other uh, strange calls, some really crazy screams and other sounds. So they are definitely one of the very spooky parts of the nighttime soundscape. Now, an analog to the barred owl during the daytime uh, is the red shoulder hawk. So if you have red shoulder hawks somewhere, you can just about be assured that there are barred owls too, because they use the same habitats and they largely on the same things. So they're, they're, they're just yin and yang, they're almost all together. It's just that the barred owls aren't nearly as conspicuous. Unless they call, you're unlikely, unlikely to see them as they hole up during the day. And barred owls really like ravines, forested ravines, and they like uh, wet, swampy woods. Those are the two things. This truly is a forest species. You're not going to find this a long way or even out of the forest at all. That's a good barred owl habitat right there. Just, uh, you know, kind of a wet, swampy woods here in Ohio. Um, or the ravine country, you know, wherever there are wooded ravines. There's the range. Again, they're mostly an eastern deciduous forest bird, like that screech owl we saw. But they also cross over and uh, occur in the northwestern United States, where they do hybridize with the uh, famous uh, spotted owl, which is in the same genus. Uh, but it's mostly thought of as an Eastern North America bird, and it's common in Ohio, every county in Ohio, wherever there's suitable habitat, there should be barred owls around. Um, most birds, probably at least half or 70% of the population here, at least in Ohio, they like to nest in broken off snags. So wherever a big branch has been knocked off of a tree and created a hollow, that's fine. They nest nests in cavities and other situations too. Young, like the great horned owl, big and fluffy, and they're pictures. They climb around the tree before they can actually fly. One thing that's been interesting to watch with barred owls and red-shouldered hawks for this matter is the, the um, <clears throat> increase in really urban areas like Cleveland or uh, Addy and here in Columbus where I am. As trees have gotten more mature in a lot of the old neighborhoods, uh, you've essentially got a de facto forest, and a lot of the big forest dwelling birds are starting to occupy those areas. So most of the big wooded ravines here, right in the city of Columbus, now have their resident barred owls, much to the delight of people who live in them, because most people like their barred owls. Here's a photo shot that was taken, I think in Clintonville, here in Columbus, in a, of one that came into the back and shaking off. Uh, the picture on the right was definitely taken in Clintonville and sent to me. And someone looked out the back window right in the middle of the city, and there's a big barred owl sitting on the wire back there, uh, where it's a resident. We'll look, take a quick look at some of the rare Ohio owls, too. But these are owls that you can find every year in Ohio, just going to take more work than the ones that we just looked at. The barn owl are a threatened species in Ohio officially. Um, 
that we've got to so know where to stuff to find, but they are out there. Um, Just for good measure, that's that horrifying call of a bar now and crack, crack, crack in between. It was very faint and hard to hear. That was its bill snapping. All owls snap their bills very powerfully and create a crack if they're threatened or around or uh, whatever. Well, this is the range in Ohio, roughly. The red counties in the state map show every place they've been known to breed. They don't breed in all those counties. Now, but by and large, the hot spot is what's called the Allegheny Crack in Ohio. That's sort of the interface region between the hill country of southeast Ohio and the glaciated flatlands to the west. That seems to be the big hot spot. Holmes County might be the best county to um, find these. Uh, but it's a, a southern bird by and large. It really doesn't get much beyond Ohio and gets increasingly rare to the north, as you can see from the North American map on the right. The uh, thing about my house uh, is they probably never were here before people, or very rare if they were. This map shows the vegetation of Ohio before European settlers altered it, and it was 95% forest. That's not good barn owl hat. They like open country and meadows and that sort of thing. So when we came in and cleared the forest and created all these pastures and leaves and meadows and fields, that really uh, allowed barn owls to move in from the south and, and, and occupy Ohio. This is classic barn owl country. As a matter of fact, there is one in a barn just out of this picture. So this is a barn owl hunting area in, in habitat area in Knox County, Ohio. Classic open country landscape with a nice barn in the middle that they can nest in. And here's a roosting barn owl. They really are well named. They love barns, old houses, that sort of thing. And if they're in the barn, they're usually sitting way up in the eaves, or towards the eaves on the hay rail that runs down the middle of the barn, just like this animal was. And it's probably easy to miss them up there. Um, <clears throat> but you probably won't miss all the pellets decorating the floor of the barn, because they're coughing up one or two of these things every day. And after a while, it makes a big mess on the floor. And that's sometimes how people figure out they've got an owl over their heads. And you don't want a fresh one. Turkey owl, you know of it, and you know it's going to fly. If you walk in the barn, um, don't do it. Because when they go out in the day, uh, in a crow season or anything like that, um, it's just you know a nightmare for the bird until they can shake their tormentors. And sometimes those tormentors can bring in birds that might eat the barn owl, which is not that big, like some hawk or maybe a great horned owl or whatever. So it's best not to disturb owls in general. Uh, if you know your presence will do that. Uh, Long-eared owl, this is very cool. We get, we get a lot more than people probably suspect in winter time and um, migration. Uh, very easy to overlook. Very furtive and very good at eating. So this long-eared owl, I took this photo and I actually saw him before he saw me, which is hard to do sometimes. But he's, he's fat and fluffed up and his ear tops are dangling like a basset hound's. Um, this is an owl in repose, basically, who's not bothered uh, at the time. This is a long-eared owl on alert. Now, he's been irritated by something or, or scared, and he sweeps himself, uh, the body into just like a stick and sticks his ornamental ear tufts up, and man, the effect can be amazingly like a broke snag, and that's what they're trying to do. So anyway, if you are watching a long-eared owl and it's sitting like that, you're too close. You're bothering it be to back off. Here's the range. This is another species of the north, like so many that we've talked about. It has it its southern limits. Um, in the winter, they have nested here, but very rarely. There's just a, basically a handful of nesting records. Mostly, we know this bird is a wintertime uh, visitor. <clears throat> this is a famous place to see them that everyone does know. This is the Plains Wildlife Area in Wyandotte County, and this grove's sort of overaging and not as good a cover thing as it used to be. But the white pines in the background um, often would have on your owls roosting in it. They like conifers. So if there are conifers around and a lot of good meadows uh, near the conifers, that's where you can find on your owls. They roost communally, too. Um, there have been roosts of lonely owls of over 100 birds reported, and that must be a sight. I've seen about 22 of them sitting together, too. 
And that's kind of a unique facet of them. Uh, more commonly here in Ohio, though, it's just a lone bird, or maybe five or six, or so. sometimes you get together. Now, a good way to find them is just look for the pellets. Don't focus on the uh, looking for the birds as necessarily. Watch the ground and look for the pellets around, or whitewash from droppings, and then start looking up above those. And that's oftentimes how people find on your house. This is great long-eared owl country. This is Kildare Plains, which is a mosaic of good roosting habitat, pines, and other and open fields to hunt at at night. Because at night they come out over the open ground and hunt that. So they need both cover and meadow. Um, they don't roost in pine trees. So this is why a lot of long-eared owls probably get missed. Because people do focus on pines, it's easier to find them there. But this is a willow thicket up along uh, Western Lake Erie Marsh in northern Ohio, and there are long wood owls in there. You'd never know it. We're looking at one here. Again, you probably need to see it. It blends in so well in these sandbar willows. It's amazing. We'll move in a little bit closer, and there you start to see it. Now, I'm shooting this with a television lens, and he's, again, at ease. He sees me, but he's not bothered. We're quite a ways away, but boy, does he blend in. We go in a little closer. He's doing his window blare at now. He's looking 180 degrees over his back at me. But again, he's still in repose. His ears aren't sticky erect and he's fluffed out and whatnot. And, uh, you know, it was a you know, good viewing situation to see these. But anyway, that's alternative habitat. They get in great pines, the gnarly tin oaks, and willow thickets a lot, and they're very hard to find. Here's a way I just wanted to share this. This is how we set up a safe viewing situation. There's a long way down the red cedar with arrow points, uh, and people are going right up to the tree and looking up at it, and, uh, you know, really it was bothering now. We figured we'd leave the roost eventually. They will use these habitually all winter long if they're not disturbed. So anyway, we found a good uh, window to view it and set up a scope, and, you know, a long ways back, and the owl then was not bothered at all by us, and people through the scope could see it really well. So you can set up situations like that really safely or, you know, without disturbing the bird. Uh, allow everyone to see it. It's a cool way to do it. And there's a view kind of like where we would be in relationship to the owl. Finally, there's a short-eared owl. Short-eared owls are really neat. They're very exciting to people. In parts are so conspicuous. Um, it's a well-known bird. It's got short little ear tufts, you know, again, ornaments, not true ears. Uh, and that's the source of the name. Well, in Western Ohio, they have nested here in the Green counties on that state map, but you know, it's not a common thing. It's a bird of the north, breeding all the way up into the Arctic tundra and points well to the north of Ohio. Winter visitors down here primarily and migrants through the state. So now it's the time to be looking for short-eared owls. Very distinctive flight. They look like giant moths. They have this really lackadaisical flight with really deep wing beats. Once you know that, you can identify them a mile away just by that flight characteristic. They tend to roost in the ground, too. These birds don't like woods. They're out in the open country in the most that sort of situation like this. This is the wilds in the background, a big reclaimed strip mine in Stewart County. The last known, known nesting that I'm aware of in Ohio was there in 1997. Someone actually found a, ne a nest of these, but the wilds always has short-eared owls in the winter. And those of you that are going on the Illinois Ecological Society's field to the wilds this Saturday, and you stay till dusk because they tend to become active right at nightfall. You know, you'll see them. They're there. I saw a bunch earlier this year at the wilds. That's where you want to look. Now, this is, if you're a meadow bird, what you don't want to look up and see. Here's a shorty owl on the hunt, hunting well, looking for rodents running around. And this guy uh, apparently has spotted one, and he's, he's going to whack it. You know, um, that's what they do is hunt bees. This is a uh, Primo sausage on legs. It's a meadow bull. It's like a mouse on steroids. They're little sausages, and everyone wants to eat them if they like meat, owls in particular. So what the short-eared owls are doing, they're looking for these meadow bulls running around out there in the, in the meadows, and they're pouncing on them. It's the primary prey staple, and the barn owl, too, and other owls as well. Snowy owls when they're down here. Here's our little owl, the northern forward owl. Cute. You know, everyone who sees that says, oh, he's cute. Well, he wouldn't be cute if you were a white-footed mouse. He would be a grim reaper on wings, because these are mice. Uh, they go after mice, not things as stout as other little, but white-footed mice. Uh, it's quite a prime staple. Um, 
that's our, our family unit on the eight, and they're really cute and they're little like that, and just started the nest. They're kind of a chocolatey brown color. But this is a very rare breed of owl. You wouldn't expect this here. There are nesting records, the counties in green, but very few and far between. And this is a very secretive bird and very, very difficult to find. Um, their core population is up in the boreal forest with us, where it's probably the most common owl in wooded situations. Little dinks, really cute. Their name stems from the sound they make, but it sounds like a saw being sharpened or wetted, just this constant monotone series of toots. And banding operations have really revealed how common these are in winter and migration. migration. Um, and that's due to the efforts in large part of Tom Bartlett in Northern Ohio and uh, uh, Kelly Seed and Bill Bostick and Bob Place here down in the Chillicothe area uh, setting up nets and focusing on the wet owls um, about, I don't know, seven or eight years ago and have caught hundreds of these birds. No one had any idea that saw wet owls were that common, so they figured out how to lure them in and catch them, band them. Very interesting data, and that really shows the value of bird banding. Because uh, we would have never known the true status of that little owl had these banders not figured out a way to uh, capture them and mark them. Uh, that leads to a lot of um, interest. The solids have been a wonderful and vast owl. The woman on the left in this picture taking notes is Jimmy Pavlicek. He writes for Ohio Magazine, and she was down there at the Leaver the Dog and Pony show with solid owls and caught one. And she wrote this wonderful article in Ohio Magazine on solid owls, but that's just one of many, many articles on solids. People are really charmed by these little animals because they're cute to us. You know, again, they're not cute if you're smaller than they are and have four legs, but um, they're just a wonderful entree, if you will, into the bird world for people who don't know a lot about birds. Um, you can stroke their head, this is a cute shot, but they seem to like that. It's almost a cat-like reflex when you do that. Well, I've got to finish with this one. This is big stuff, uh, as we all know. And most of the eastern United States, yeah, we've had a huge eruption of snow owls. Normally, we only get a handful in Ohio up along Lake Erie, but not here. The map on the left, that's the normal winter condition for the handful that make it down here. They bleed more Arctic. The red on the other map is high uh, up in polar bear country. And so they don't often make it down here, but they did see it. The best spots for snow owls in Ohio are along the shore of Lake Erie. They like harbors, like uh, Lorraine Harbor here, or uh, East 72nd Street in Cleveland. You know, lakefront habitat. There's lots of ducks and gulls that they can prey on. But this year, they've gone far beyond that. That's a great shot by Chuck Skusarczyk. He works at the uh, Hopkins Airport in Cleveland. And there's been as many as eight of these snow owls out there at one time. Chuck's taken some amazing shots of them. All, virtually all the birds that we get down here are chures. These are birds that were born last summer on, in the Arctic, and uh, they're heavily barred. This is a female. Females are very heavily barred with black. Um, and very rare to see a pure white adult down here. I, I don't think we've ever had one. It's all the young ones that come down here. There's Scott's picture of another young um, a male, I believe, up checking the pellet. Here's some factoids. This is the biggest North American owl. A big female, females being bigger than males, can weigh six pounds. 922 ruby throated hummingbirds make one of those things. It's just a wild diversity in the bird world. Last summer, where these owls came from, when the lemmings have really spiked to all-time population highs, that's what they're feeding on mostly, uh, a snow owl might take 1,600 lemmings in a year. That's 190 pounds of lemming steak. That's a lot of lemmings. Uh, and the their eruption southward is the lemming population, whether it booms or spikes. I'll talk a little about it. This year, the last big year we had, where uh, you'd probably have to go back into the early 40s or 30s to find a winner with comparable number of owls as to what we've had this year. Uh, this year has been amazing. I just updated this map today. I think we're at 134 owls in 36 counties in Ohio. 
you could conceivably run across a snowy owl almost in the open country landscape in a state this year. So keep your eyes peeled for that. Uh, I'm storm where they're uh, doing a lot of research, taking advantage of all these snowy owls that are down here this year. Uh, this, uh, they're putting radio transmitters on site. I'll put it up there. You can learn all about this. But those uh, purple lines show the pattern of uh, snowy owl trick tagged and can follow, and it's going out to sea. This is in Maryland. And it's going out to sea at night, and it's probably picking up ducks, uh, sweeping out in the water, sitting ducks, if you will. So, the, you know, the birds that are around water and lots of gulls and ducks probably do better because they're going out at night, you know, and picking these things off when they're at sleep. So there's a plentifully caught food source for them. Here's where most of the snowy owls, all of them, probably come from this year. That part of the northern Quebec tundra, east of Hudson Bay, that enormous explosion of lemmings, small rodents I showed you, and lemmings uh, tend to bloom about every four years. They reach population highs. It's a very pat fragmented pattern across the tundra. Other parts of the tundra didn't have many lemmings, but that part of the bed, and this seems to be where these owls are originating from. Uh, there's a little lemming. Um, that's an animal you don't want to be if you're in the Arctic and there's snow owls around because that's what they eat. This is an amazing photograph. This is an owl nest, snowy owl nest in northern Quebec tundra from last summer. The eggs have not even hatched yet of the snowy owl, and the nest is ringed with 78 carcasses of lemmings and wolves. And those young owls hatched uh, food of plenty, and that's how it was. So they, that part of the tundra produced a super crop of young owls. There is not enough sustenance to sustain all those youngsters that are out there now through the winter up there, so the young birds have to come south. And that's this eruption that we're seeing. Those young owls, they don't worry about people or, or pickup trucks, and a lot of them get buicked by cars on the highway. This is one that got hit in Wood County by a pickup truck, but the owl uh, survived amazingly. It's an amazing shot. He's peering out of the grill of the truck. Um, the guy, fortunately, was willing to handle it. He hit the right truck if he had to hit one, and uh, opened the hood and got the owl out of there and set it on its seat, and the owl shook it up, and he saw it hunting. So apparently that one survived, but a lot of them don't. Roadkill is probably the biggest source of mortality, I would say, in populous areas when they come south. Well, I want to finish up on this thing with a, 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 a few reasons why owls are important. We talked about that. They are charismatic mega fauna, and people like them, so they're good entrees to get people interested in the natural world. Here's a good example. Well, this was a great horned owl nest that was in a, a very busy urban area in Columbus, Ohio made the newspaper in the news because it was so conspicuous and thousands of people probably went out and saw that owl. It became a bigger celebrity than most people, politicians around here. It was great. Got a lot of people interested in owls. They're important predators, very important, with balance ecosystems. Um, again, I'll refer back to the example this year. Snowy owls in the tundra feeding on all those lemmings um, are doing an immense service. Their, their role is vital. They, there are probably 100,000 snowy owls in North America, in the tundra, roughly. Well, in a conservative estimate, they're probably eating each one 800 lemmings a year. You add all that up, that's 80 million lemmings a year, 14 million pounds of things. Um, that plays a big role in the uh, fragile ones of the tundra ecosystem and all those plants and other things that the lemmings are eating. You've got to have these big predators out there uh, you know, providing that balance. <clears throat> Um, they're also wonderful to educate people about nature. And again, because it is so conspicuous, I'm going to use the snowy owl as an example. Snowy owls are ambassadors of the Arctic. Most of us will never set foot up there on the tundra, but it's still an incredibly important resource to people here in Ohio. Um, uh, 90 species of birds that occur every year in Ohio, that's where they come from. Our sandpipers, a lot of our rap, of our songbirds, etc. Arctic, up where the snowy owls have a tundra ecosystem, we wouldn't have all those birds as well. Uh, a lot of our waterfowl, 22 species out of the 47 or whatever that are in Ohio every year, that's where they're coming from the tundra, just like the snowy owls. Uh, shorebirds galore, a lot of our gulls, et cetera. You can see the numbers there. So it's not just snowy owls coming from up there. They're just very, very conspicuous. Um, this, I'm going to end on this. This is a Harris's sparrow. Now, someone like me, who's a birder, that is really cool. It's very rare in Ohio. There are two of them in Ohio right now. Coming to feeders, and the hardcore listers get really excited over these. You will never 
web general public is interested in the tundra by using the Saris's sparrow, um, as you will, this spectacular five white snowy owl that's headed from the right. Uh, so a lot of people have gotten to see snowy owls, and consequently, it's been a wonderful chance to educate people about the importance of the uh, Arctic ecosystem to Ohio and elsewhere in the South. And I'll use my time up. Uh, I do want to just put a plug for our CD. We have a booklet in the CD that covers all these owls and everything that is about, and we provide those for free uh, at the Division of Wildlife. Call that number on the screen, and we'll gladly send you those. Uh, encourage that. And I want to thank all the people who helped share photos with me and give me permission as well. And I've used all my time, and probably one of them get the answer questions. <laughs> Well, thank um, you. Anyway, that was really a great presentation. Um, I think there's, there's a, one quick question that maybe we can squeeze in here. Um, you've talked a lot about snowy owls, um, and we all know you've been maintaining a map of where to see snowy owls in Ohio. And I was wondering if maybe you could um, just let us think or where we could see that. Yeah, um, absolutely. And, it, you know, I'll stay on here longer. If someone really has a burning question they want to ask, I'm fine with that. Um, but I know okay. we're supposed to end it at one. But anyway, uh, three hours, where to find them. Lorraine. The Lake Erie, the harbor at Lorraine uh, is probably the best place. There are two of them hanging around there, and they've been proven easy to find for the most part. Uh, downtown Cleveland, that area has been fairly good for them. But if you're here in central Ohio, um, there has been one hanging out at the extreme western end of Buckeye Lake. Okay, it's in the state park, Buckeye Lake State Park, at a place called Weeb's Landing. L I E B apostrophe S Landing. Weeb's Landing at Buckeye State Lake Park. You can Google it right up. And I know it's been there for several days. Perfect. Um, yeah, some people might have to leave if you were joining us during your lunch hour. Thank you so much for joining us. I hope you um, enjoyed the webinar. For those of you that can stick around a little, we do have a few questions here, Jim, that I noted um, that maybe you could address if you have a minute to stick around. Yeah, yeah. Please, please share them with me because I, I got too wrapped up in talking about them. I really wasn't <laughs> paying attention to questions, and I'm sorry. Sure. But uh, um, yeah, ask me now. The first question we had was, um, how do owl populations in Ohio today compare with populations during um, the DDT years? Yeah, great question, whoever asked that. Thank you. Um, we don't know nearly as well, I don't think, because owls are just a lot harder to study. Now, the, the benchmark birds of the disaster of DDT would be like bald eagle and peregrine falcon and some of those very obvious predators, but owls are so hard to study and observe, and relatively few people do. And we probably really don't know that. My mm -hmm. hunch, though, is that it probably really did hurt species like barn owls, especially, and some of the others. But um, I just don't have a good answer for that. Great. Um, OK, and the, another question was, um, you mentioned, of course, the snowy owls um, moving down here from the Arctic. What they be eating um, when they're down here? Well, yeah, they're, they're, they're opportunistic. Another question, thank you. Um, they have been known to take prey, believe it or not, to the size of great peoples, and they can do that, but mostly they're after rodents. Snowy owls, just like the lemmings in the north, when they come down here, they'll go after all meadow ghouls and uh, mice. Uh, there's been a few that have set up uh, in urban areas and will take Norway rats. Uh, so really, whatever's around, there's a famous bird in Cleveland that would even land at times on people's car. This is a number of winters ago, right on the lakefront of Lake a lot of rats in that particular area, you know, it's picking those off. But um, uh, they'll take a lot of birds, they take a lot of ducks, uh, they'll even take balls, things like that. So basically anything that they can overpower and kill. Great. And then a final question we had was, um, where is the pellet formed um, when an owl does that? And could you tell us a little bit about that kind of digestion process? Yeah, yeah, and I'm not an expert on that, but I'll do my best. How does an owl pellet form? It, uh, I think it, it's basically in the stomach, okay? So the owl, um, uh, if possible at least, will swallow its prey whole. A lot of times it's a mouse or a boy and it can do that. So then it's, does it, did, did, excuse me, digestive enzymes in the stomach, uh, you know, they wear away the soft parts which get, get digested, the meat. And, and then uh, the bones in the pellet are there. And I don't know the exact physical process, but it basically, like a garbage compactor, compacts it into a, uh, usually a round or an oval hard pellet, 
of corn bones. And when the time is right, the owl just, as we saw in the pictures, um, up checks it, you know, casts it back out through an owl. And that's what we see. And by the way, the pellets are often useful in research because people identify the victims from what's back in the pellet <laughs> by the spars and whatnot. And you can see the prey that they're after. All right. Well, if we don't have any other questions here, I want to thank Jim again. Um, that was a, a wonderful presentation. I certainly learned a lot. I hope our um, viewers did as well. And um, I hope that all of you will join us for our presentation next month. Um, again, that will be with Paula Zebarth on Purple Martins. So, um, do again.